Okay. What page, Jim? Okay, welcome to Getting to Know Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Our, we're on page lesson 38, which is in Getting to Know Jesus, volume 4. No, we're three. on page uh, 141. Lesson 3. I need book 3, honey. Not book four. 3. See, that's what I said. Take what I mean, <laughs> not what I said. <laughs> uh, page 141. The Bible text is on pages 142 and 143. And the lesson notes are on pages 144 to 149. And you notice there's room in there to write notes uh, for additional things you want to write down there. Gee, we're in the Sermon on the Mount, and part three. We're going to be in the Sermon on the Mount another few weeks. We're, we're not crashing through this one event, because it is just so full of rich. I could probably spend a year just on the Sermon on the Mount and not run out of sermon material. But you have to draw the line somewhere, so I break it into chunks this size, and we're going to go with it. Tonight we're going to talk about how to be perfect. How to be what? Perfect. How to be perfect. Now here's our little timeline, and that is in the book, front of uh, book three. And you can see that we're covering this span within the first half of Jesus' second year of ministry. So that's the, we're, we're somewhere in here, and he's just chosen the twelve apostles. We oftentimes think that Jesus chose the 12 apostles right here as soon as he turned age 30, but he took a year kind of recruiting and developing his following, and then out of that following, he said, well, now let's see now, God, which ones are the ones that you want me to use to start the church? And God gave him the 12 names. Of course, we noticed Jews was a traitor, but uh, out of that 11 that remained, look what God has done. And we're here because of it. So... <coughs> How to be perfect. Oh, here is another uh, picture of our little map. I went on Google just to make sure, and north is over here. What happened to the ECT? Perfect. <laughs> perfect. 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 I'm going to have to have a talk with that guy when it's I get It's a digital home. glitch. Uh, this is, north, north is up here, east is up here at the top, so this is, again, laid out uh, the Jewish way. Uh, I'll have to go back in when I get home, re rotate that picture around, so... It uh, shows out right, but here is where the Mount of Beatitudes is, and you can see from the Mount of Beatitudes, looking down behind it, the Sea of Galilee. Not that far from the sea. You consider the area where Jesus traveled is, what, smaller than the state of Florida that we're in right now. And, of course, he walked everywhere he went. That's why he couldn't get his dad didn't make him get a haircut. <laughs> what did that mean? <laughs> what? No, that's why the Webster wrote the dictionary. Here, huh? Okay. God never, and I, I want to really drill this down in deep in our hearts. It's going to convict us. It's going to hurt a little bit, but it's a hurt we need to hurt. God never expects anything of us that we aren't able to do. To do so would be cruel and unfair, and that is totally against the nature of God. Why should we even try to be good before God and refrain from sin if we don't have the power to say no to sin? We do have that power. The fact that we do sin does not negate the above statement, but only goes to reinforce how selfish we are. Uh, can anybody tell me what's in the middle of sin? Aye. 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 I am yet to find a sin that is not selfish. About I. Mm -hmm. And there ain't no I in humble yet. <laughs> no I in humble. There's so. you in humble. <laughs> we can take that into mind. So what happens... There's E too, we. What happens is rather than obey God... We repeatedly choose to do it our own selfish way and commit another sin. Ouch! That hurts. Even in the Old Testament, if you were to go back and study the Old Testament and look up the 613 laws that the Jews were required to live by, tell me which law in those 613 laws they could not keep. That's right. They could keep every one of them. There was not a one that they could not keep, including the Ten Commandments. The only problem is, they never did. <laughs> and of course, we know now that the Old Testament was to point us to the cross. And the New Testament 
is to point us to the cross. And everything centers around Jesus dying on the cross for your sins and mine, being raised from the dead and giving us eternal life. Now we've got that. Let me get back to our subject here. One way or another, everyone would break one or more of the commandments of the Jewish law. Thus, some actually realized that they would never be good enough to please God. I tried. I try. How many of you are trying to please God? Let's see a hand there. The rest of you have got some sort of paralysis. I know. <laughs> <laughs> we all want to please God. When you were growing up, you wanted to please your earthly daddy. Amen. And, and how much it made you feel good. I remember a time when my oldest was about two years old. I called him from the other room in there to come in here where I was. I gave him a piece of paper and said, will you throw this away? And... I don't remember the wastebasket was just over here a few feet. It wasn't that far away. But he was delighted to do something to please Daddy. And we would be delighted if we could do something to please our Heavenly Daddy. That's what we're going to talk about tonight. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is telling us how we can live a life that is pleasing to God. We're in Matthew chapter 5, verses 33 through 48, and Luke chapter 6, verses 29 through 36. And if you look on pages 42 and 43 of your book, you've got those side by side. They're on the page, New International Version, so you can follow along and, and uh, see that I'm talking about the right verses. We do uh, try to do that. Jesus continues his ordination sermon after having selected 12 apostles. And he's giving us some very important instruct instructions about how we can be perfect and pleasing to God. And one of the things you want to remember is that integrity counts. Oh, well, here's another good word about integrity. That's what it's all about. That is the only, that is, that is one thing in your life that you can control. We're all looking to control something. Oh, I want to control my health. Oh, I want to control my finances. Oh, I want to control my neighbors. I want to control those tenants in my property that won't get out. We're all looking for something to control. We can't control our health. We can influence our health. We can try to eat healthy or we can eat unhealthy. We can exercise or we can sit around and, and not exercise and the consequences come thereof. But we can't really control it. We can't even control the day we die. Unless we commit suicide. And I would not recommend that. To, to have, uh, I just don't think that would be a good way. I, I'll put it this way. I don't want to be remembered as somebody who gave up and committed suicide. And there has been a time or two when I have felt tempted. And I'm probably all of you at one time or another have been in a situation in your life where, you know what, I think I'll just take my life and be done with it. Praise God you haven't done that. So you're still here, you're, you're toughing it out, and you're going to be glad you stuck around. Amen, that's it. It had nothing to do with me, but you're going to be glad you stuck around anyhow. <clears throat> Jesus is going to give us some practical guidelines on how we can live a life that is pleasing to God. Ooh, would that be wonderful to live a life pleasing to God. As much as we want our earthly Father's approval, how much more valuable it is to get our heavenly Father's approval. <clears throat> what are the ways in which we can build our integrity? So let's talk to the first one. The first one here is don't take ghosts. We're in Matthew chapter 5, verses 32 through 48. Jesus says, and, and this is right in the middle of his Sermon on the Mount, so we're just right into the middle of his talk. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but keep the oath you have made to the Lord. But I tell you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, or your, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. Well, I wish I could. <laughs> <laughs> I even tried that Grecian formula stuff 20 plus years ago. It didn't work. <laughs> Simply let your yes be yes, your no be no, and anything beyond this, it comes from the evil one. Wow, that's an awesome story. Does that mean the Grecian formula comes from the evil one? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Well, so we're supposed to stay away from oaths and just make it yes and no. If you say yes, mean yes, and don't say yes until you forget about it. If you say no, mean no. As a parent, 
Your children are going to find out real quick whether your yes means yes or your no means no. And if once they learn that daddy is consistent, then you have a lot easier job parenting. Because when you say, well, I said, they know, the, they know the consequences of not doing what daddy said. Ah, next time I'll obey daddy. Well, <clears throat> let's get back to subject there. Swearing is of no good unless you do what you take an oath to do. How many of us have taken an oath? Oh, I promise I'm going to take you to the park. And then something happens and you never get up to the park. Oh, I promise I'm going to invite you over for dinner someday. 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 Oh, I forgot that I said I was going to invite him over for dinner today. Someday. They haven't forgotten, but I forgot. Uh, all sorts of things. It's far better than taking an oath is to do the deed. Like Instead of saying, just... I'm going to take you in the park, to the park someday, I'll say, go get in the car, we're going to the park right now. That must keep us from procrastination or something. Then, if it's oh, that would not be a bad idea. That must be what it is. I'm going to have you over for dinner someday. What are you folks doing next Tuesday night? What are you doing this weekend? I don't know are you available, doing, guys? <laughs> <laughs> About 7:30. Is that okay? <laughs> Actually, uh, dinner will be at uh, seven in the morning. But don't knock on my door. I'll probably be just getting out. Uh, uh, seven the next morning. Uh, anyhow, uh, what matters is not whether or not you, what matters are, is whether you what are, whether or not you do what you claim you are going to do. If I say I'm going to do it, am I going to do it? Yes. Or am I just bluffing you? I've been uh, I, don't, I don't want to go into those situations, but I can tell you there have been some situations where I have dealt with uh, that issue of saying I was going to do something and they called my bluff and found out I wasn't bluffing. So be a, a man of your word or a woman of your word. You say you're going to, don't say you're going to do something and be on good intentions. Now we all have good intentions and we always want to, want, want to impress others and we want other people to think well of us and we have a good intention when we do a lot of things but how many times have we made promises or made, oh I'm going to do this and we even though that's true, and we get still, occupied and diverted, and we forget about it. What did you say, Morty? Even morning? though that's true, you're still going to do it. Mm -hmm. So, if you say you're going to do it, do it. <clears throat> well, let's go on. Dealing with people who are trying to take advantage of you. Matthew <laughs> chapter 5. Does anybody here Holy have any moly. difficulties with somebody trying to take advantage of you? Holy moly. Yeah. Let me rephrase that question. Is there anybody here that does not have somebody trying to do There you go. Now it's getting a lot easier to answer. Matthew chapter 5, <laughs> verses 38 to 41, and Luke 6, 29. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek or one cheek, turn to him the other also. If someone wants you to take your tunic or take your cloak, let him have your cloak as well. Don't stop him from taking your tunic. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. <laughs> Easy for him. One question for you. How does that apply to a tenant who wants to not only take your house, but take right. possession, hand in the hand of the detail for the free? We need to talk about that during discussion time. That would be a, a, a worthy topic. So write a note down there on the discussion questions. Oh, we'll and take a let's, note. Let's explore that a little bit. We're going to go on right now. Life is not about being taken advantage of. Is there anybody here who's never been taken advantage of? That's what I thought. The rest of us have. So, life is about loving God and loving people. And sometimes in the process of loving God and loving people, you will be taken advantage of. Now, there has to be boundaries. You cannot let people just have carte blanche of taking advantage of you. Some people will kill you. And if you don't defend your life, you will die. So you have, I think, I believe, a biblically sound right to protect your life from somebody who wants to take advantage of taking your life. Your property is your property. You have a right to protect it. And uh, so that would factor in there too. And now how you go about protecting it may have some pros and cons. Is this reflecting Christ? Is this not? Uh... We, we have to do it within limits of laws that we live in within our country. 
Serving others is a way of showing love for God and showing love to them. We should use some judgment in whom we serve and how we serve, but leave the results to God. Mm -hmm. So you've given money to a homeless person, and just out of curiosity you watched, and they made a beeline for the liquor store. Um. And you said that was a waste of money. Or you sold somebody something, and they paid you for part of it, and they paid you for part of it, and then they didn't pay you anymore, and there's just absolutely no way you can squeeze juice out of a lemon that's all dried up. Or they skipped and skedaddled, you have no way of finding to know where they went to collect from them what they owe you. Hopefully it wasn't a big amount of money. If it was, oh, ouch. And sometimes you just have to let it go. Sometimes you have a recourse. Uh, if you can recourse, if it is significant enough, you report it to the police, they file a cl uh, claim, they get them arrested someday, and they get punished for what they did. But sometimes you just end up taking a loss. Some of you can tell us stories about that as you're going through some of the stuff you're going through right now. How about considering that it is not as important to defend your rights as it is to show grace, kindness, and the forgiveness of God? Now again, some situations you may not need to show grace. If you're trying to take my life, I'm not going to just go down willingly. I'm going to do what I can within my means to protect my life and my wife. Oh. But uh, if I'm in a situation where there's nothing I can do, then I'm going to let God take care of you. So I must be saying, be kind to a bad situation until it gets out of hand or something. That's a good way of saying it, yeah. Most situations, uh, well, I can't say most, a lot of situations, we can, okay, that person took advantage of it. They cut me off on the freeway. Life's not important about being in front of them, so let them go. They didn't quite stop the stop sign. We almost hit. Well, they missed you, so let it go. That was $10 he owes me. $1,000 he owes George. And I don't know how much he owes Richard. If we ever get to collect, great. If we don't, we're going to have to let it go. Let us talk about giving and borrowing. Matthew chapter 5, verse 42, Luke 6, chapter 6, verse 30. Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you, or do not demand it back. Now, wait a minute. I'm kind of possessive of my money and stuff. Of course, it's a lot better if you give voluntarily than when somebody else comes and takes it away from you without asking your permission, like the government. Jesus is encouraging us to give to others without trying to control them. Sometimes we're giving us, I'll give this to you, but you've got to do this for me. Kind of like politics, isn't it? Yeah. We do want to use good judgment and not give money to somebody that's going to use it for alcohol or drugs. And so there's a little caution. Do you want to give a, a, a homeless person on the corner that's got a sign, are they really homeless? Or they just figured out that's an easy way to get money without going out and getting a J-O-B. Yeah. I don't know. I, I cannot be the judge. And I really can't. I, I have my opinion. I cannot criticize. I, by the grace of God, have not been there. There have been a time or two I've wondered. But I haven't been there. Uh, I do know that some are out there and it's just like, hey, why should I go get a job? Why should I go get a home? I can live in the bushes over here, hold this little sign and get all the money I need. And I'm happy, and I don't pay taxes, and I don't do this, and of course people don't like me around, because I sometimes need a shave and a shower and a few other things. But um, what do I care? I'm totally independent, free, kind of. Well, anyway. So we don't want to contribute to somebody's bad behavior. However, once you have given a gift, you do not have the right to tell the receiver how to live or how to use that gift. Now, some of us are wise. If we're going to help somebody on the corner, or they're coming up begging to us, oh, well, I haven't eaten in 33 days. Oh, well, come on over here, I'll buy you a hamburger. I don't want a hamburger, I just want the money. Uh, I, I, back when, it, when I was preaching in uh, uh, Carson, California, I had started to put together a list of resources. So if somebody said, I need help, well, what kind of work do you do? Can I help you find a job? Um, 
here's an agency that can provide the kind of help you need. And I would direct them <coughs> to other sources that can help them. <coughs> but hopefully they could get the specialized help they need. And I never gave them cash. Uh, but I, I would try to help them in other ways. So you'll have to figure out how God's called you to do it. And, and like I said, well, you, once you help them, it's up to them. If they don't do good with it, then you'll know you don't want to help that person again. Likewise, we should not be offended when someone borrows something and doesn't give it back. Now, it may depend on the value of it, how, to how much you go after it. I mean, you've got a tenant in your house, you just can't let them live there as squatters without paying. Uh, they won't take good care of your house if, if you do. So, you ha they, there are obligations that, they have a, that you have a right to to expect them to meet. And the government gives us laws. Even the Bible would tell us that, uh, would tell them that what they're doing is wrong, is stealing. We don't have to sit here. And we, we, it's kind of a hard balance, isn't it? Your mind's going through this situation. Well, well this, this situation is absolute, man. You go after the person. This situation is, now you let it go. And this situation is in the middle. Now, do I go after them or do I let it go? And you're going to have to kind of work that out one day at a time. But if you focus on loving God and loving people, I am of the opinion that God will give you the wisdom to know which ones to go after and which ones to let go. And if you lose it, how many of you lost money on stock market or on real estate or on gold or on previous <laughs> marriages or on whatever? Yeah, easy to do. Where do you start? <laughs> If it's really, really, really important, God will give it back to you. Right. And if it's not, it wasn't important in the first place. <coughs> what you've got is eternal life and nothing. Yeah. All the gold in the world won't buy that. <coughs> Likewise, uh, I, uh, we, we should thank God that we have it to give. One uh, situation. I was preaching in Carson, California. A guy called me up and said, Hey, I need some money. Can you meet me here and give me some money? I called one of the elders in the church. He said, Yeah, I'll come over. I'll give you some money. I got the money from the elder, took it over to this person, gave it to him, and uh, he gave me his address and a phone number and said, come over here and I'll give it back to you. A few days later, I went over to the house, the address that he gave me, to collect the money. The people there didn't know who he was. Oh, no. Oh, no. Never saw him again. I think it was only $100. The elder said, well, don't worry about it. I had it to give. And that was his attitude. Was his Thank Steve? God you had it to give. <laughs> and if you get it back, great. And if you don't get it back, well, yeah. life's not fair. You'll hear more about that Sunday. Come for my sermon, rules number one. However, uh, it hurts when you don't get it back. And when you sell something and a buyer never pays the balance due, it hurts. But is it worth anything in eternity? No. No? hundred years from now, it doesn't matter. hundred years from now, it's not going to matter. Probably even five or ten years from now, it's not going to matter. Probably a few days from now, it's not really going to matter on a lot of these situations that we gain or we lose. So, we need to use judgment when we lend and when to retrieve it or when to let it go. Wow, you know, that's something because that's our number one mortgage problem in this country right now. They're not using their brains. Well, Corruption. We, was, we used our brains going in and life changed and now we don't have any brains. <laughs> or some people didn't use our brains going in and life changed and they still don't have any brains. George? Uh, you know, there's some things that if I dwell on it, you'll ruin me. Yes. You know, and I've just, yeah. certain things I've, I'll, th something will come up in my mind and I'll think, oh, I, rem I remembered, I said to myself, let it go. And that's the only way to handle it, because if it don't, it'll ruin you. You just have to learn to let it go. If it's important to God, then He'll take care of it. Right. But what's most important is loving God <coughs> and loving people. And if we've got that part down, God will give us discernment on these other things. Well, let's go on a little further. We're not perfect yet, but we're making progress there. We're going to talk about, oh, uh, now wait a minute there. Uh, and it's just going from deeper to deeper to deeper, isn't it? Loving your enemies? 
<laughs> we should talk to the Muslims about this. <laughs> you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, Jesus is speaking. You notice he doesn't say George tells you or, or, or Isaiah tells you or, or Samuel tells you. He says, I tell you, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who persecute you that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes His Son to rise on the evil and the good. He sends a rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Unrighteous. Do unto others, Luke says, as you would have other them do to you. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? <laughs> Are not even the tax collectors and the sinners doing that? They love those who love them. And if you greet only your brothers and do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that? What are you doing more than anyone else? Even the pagans or the sinners do that. I heard somebody today say that even evil people have to be good to other evil people. Yeah. Which shows, if nothing else, that tr good triumphs over evil. Good is superior to evil. Doing what is right is always superior to doing what is wrong. And so... Loving your enemies is superior. Oh, we're not done yet. Let's read the rest of this. Luke uh, 6, verses 34 to 36. If you lend to those whom you expect repayment, what credit is it to you? Even the sinners lend to sinners, expected to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. And then your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked, be merciful just as your Father is merciful. That word kind sounds a little better than love <laughs> where you ended up at. You're talking about one and then... It, it, helps, <laughs> it helps to kind of clarify the picture. You know what really helps too is to go in and see how other translators, translations use this passage. We're using the New International Version here because it's a, a good translation that's very readable to our English, American English way of thinking. But uh, some other translations will give you some other words that just sometimes help to make it even a little more understandable. Well, loving your enemies. We will make more friends out of enemies by loving them than we will by fighting them. Our goal is to change their hearts by loving them to Jesus. Now some people will respond and some people will not. Our goal is not to make them respond. Our goal is to love them as God loves them and then let that do its work. Uh, if you follow me on Facebook, you know that I have a difficult time with people who believe that homosexuality is uh, uh, what's that, a lifestyle or a race like black or Hispanic or... Yeah. Asian or something, and uh, oh, no. but I, I have That's to be careful in my comments really? yeah. that I don't hate homosexuals. I have to declare it that that I am opposed to homosexual Very immorality. And actually, I usually just say sexual immorality because that encompasses homosexuals, pedophiles, rapists, pornographers, uh, adulterers, fornicators, and a few others that follow under that list. Anybody that's having sex outside of marriage, but. We, we have to distinguish between hating the sin, but not hating the person. Jesus says, loving your enemies does not include allowing them to kill you or your family, or not protecting yourself against attack. We talked about that a little bit ago. We have a right, if not an obligation, to defend our families and our own lives against any enemy that threatens us. But, there are a lot of situations where if you can let your neighbor that you don't agree with their lifestyle or their behavior or their beliefs, know that you love them, you'll be more likely to win them to Christ than if you get in their face and say, you're going to hell because you're doing this and you're doing that. And so that's, that's, that's the thing that really separates Christianity from all of the other religions in the world. Many of the religions uh, coerce. You become our religion or we'll kill you. Mm -hmm. Or we'll make you suffer, we'll throw you in jail, we'll do this, we'll do that. Make you very sorry you didn't become our religion. Christianity says, Jesus loves you. And God will forgive you no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, as long as you have breath in your body. If you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior on the way to your execution, there's still eternal life for you, if it's sincere in your heart. God knows. You can fool me, but God knows. 
But mind you, and I, and I've had some situations where we had some neighbors uh, next door to us that were homosexuals. We didn't get in their face. It was kind of like odd that uh, they two guys were living in the same one bedroom apartment. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, we we didn't sit there and pass judgment on them. We just said hi, how you guys doing? And sometimes we'd talk with them a little bit. We tried to be neighbors. Um, there's some other people that I've, I've had interaction with that were involved in homosexuality that uh, I, I just accepted them as a person. I didn't get in their face about it. I wonder what would have happened if we'd had more time, if we might have helped them to come out of that lifestyle and learn about Jesus. Let me add a little script here. I saw a thing about Jamaica the other night, and there was 20 people living in a little bitty hut, not as big as this room. Wow. That's because they're poor. Help me, Jesus. You would be disappointed to know how many people all over the world have a house not much bigger than this room. And that's their home. Wow, that's small. And we can't do without our two or three bedrooms and two bathrooms. Gotta have, and if it's one bathroom, we better have double sinks. <laughs> yeah, right. And sometimes double toilets. <laughs> We're so used to wow. our way of living, we yeah. don't realize how poor. Oh, man. Uh, uh, email from a Pakistani minister this week of a Christian family that was murdered in their home. Didn't have much of a home to defend. They don't have much. Go with Richard to Jamaica. He'll talk to you about the houses that mm -hmm. some of the people in his churches live in over mm -hmm. there. Some <coughs> of the preachers that are learning to preach. Dirt floors. Yeah. Dirt floors? Yeah. Take your vacuum sweeper of that. <laughs> well, according to what you've been saying so far, is that if, if a couple of us, or maybe all of us, wanted to move in here, I think Pastor and, and his wife should accept us. There's only 14 of us, so we're going to be 20. That could save us a lot of money and rent. I know. Yeah. Well, let's see. That's <laughs> 15 <laughs> times $300 a month. 4500 a month, you can have it, and I'll go get me a sweet somewhere. And they should expect any payback, really. <laughs> yeah, he's the preacher. I mean, he's a Christian. He's supposed to just love and give. And right. not I mean, he can win, but the love, 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 love God and love others. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, we keep that spare room for uh, busy. So somehow, I don't think that's quite good with it, but us. we like to think yeah. about it. Well, here's two one more. Two at a time. Two at a time. Two at a time. Here's one more. And this is the kicker. Wow, yeah. Be perfect. Jesus says, be perfect, therefore, as your Heavenly Father is perfect. Do we have something to work on? Oh, yeah. Have we arrived? No. Do you know when you're going to arrive? No. I do. When he gets, when he you gets. arrive when you get to heaven. Yeah. There, you will be perfect. Until then, you're working on it. Morty? Make it a little more easy for folks. The word perfect in the Greek means complete. Mm. Be complete, oh, cool. therefore. That is nice. You know, yeah, that's yeah. a little more easy. Yeah. Yeah. Santini are not that either. So no. And well, if you are in Christ, <laughs> you are you think so, complete. Right? complete. Yourself, you? Well, you know, we may be struggling with... Chuck? Uh, the thought of Christ imputes righteousness to us. Yes. When God sees us, He sees us as perfect in His Yeah. yeah. Right. We don't see ourselves as perfect. Mm -hmm. So the Jews couldn't figure that out. Be perfect. Uh, and uh, I believe Jesus was talking about Pentecost. Because on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 Jews were perfected and made perfect by the blood of Jesus Christ. There you go. Yeah. And God did not see their sin and never does see their sin. Like you, me, because we are blameless, irreproachable, and, um, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, un and we're justified. Because when God said, I see the blood, I pass over. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So our it's, perfection, basically, is in our spirit that is regenerated. It's Christ. not a physical perfection. Whoops, I just did something that yeah. was unpleasing yeah, yeah, to God. Yeah, I think too. Cool. But it's a, it's, it's a spiritual because God says, I know you love me. I know you slipped. But I know you love me. And I'm just going to overlook it. Exactly. He overlooks it. And passes over. over. Trudy's thought. Uh, you know, we, we don't understand that Sermon on the Mount because it's not addressing uh, 
what we call civil law and criminal law. Yeah. It's addressing personal relationships only. That's right. Yeah. Uh, it, 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 Jesus is not uh, encouraging people to break civil and criminal laws. The book of Deuteronomy deals with that, and Christ did not destroy that. That's carried over into the New Testament. We would actually be encouraging people to go to hell if we allow them to break laws at our expense. Uh, every one of those teachings in that Sermon on the Mount are personal relationships with other people dealing with personal conduct in regard to benevolence and charity and grace. Awesome. That has nothing to do with it. For instance, I would lay down my life for Christ in a heartbeat. Yeah. Uh, if the communists came in here or uh, Obama sent a whole task force of people to kill all anti-homosexuals, anti-sodomites, I'd be the first to die. Uh, because I would take my stand on what Christ told me. And if the, if the government said they're going to kill me, I would die. But I'm not going to die for nothing. Right. If someone comes in here and tries to hurt us, I'll fight for you. And yes. notice he said, love your enemies. He didn't say love God's enemies. Yeah. And he didn't say love your neighbor's enemies. In fact, I'm my brother's keeper. It's all personal. It has nothing to do with civil or criminal law. That's right. And that's where we get confused. In fact, my banker says to me, he said, I'm having a problem with this. Uh, love your enemies. Mm -hmm. And uh, he says, I got people in this bank I'd like to kill. <laughs> so, and uh, I said, yeah, but they're not your, your enemies. They're enemies of society. They're enemies of the judicial system. They're enemies of the financial system, aren't they? He said, yeah. I said, well, you don't have to love them. Just love your enemies. <laughs> he said, man, thanks for letting me off the hook. <laughs> <laughs> of course, you better not go out and start killing those enemies either. <laughs> well, let's be perfect. Let's be complete. We will never achieve perfection on this earth. We just talked about that a minute ago. Perfection, but if we love God, we will definitely make an effort to avoid sin and live in a way that pleases God and is acceptable to all mankind. I think, so, to me, so much of our Christian life hinges around, do you love God? Do you love Jesus? If you love God, well, let's put this one. Let's, let's get done. When a guy loves a girl, what's he want to do? Anything and everything he can to please that girl. When a girl loves a guy, what's she going to do? Anything to make her man happy. If you love God, what are you going to do? Anything and everything you can to make God happy. <laughs> Get all choked up here. If you love Jesus, you're going to want to do the things that make Him happy. You're not going to want to do the things that hurt Him. <laughs> so we're going to want to be perfect. We're going to want to fight against sin. We're going to want to be loving towards our neighbors and our enemies and a few others. We're going to want to do the right thing. In other words, perfection is imparted to us by the grace of God, which is what Chuck was just talking about, through the life-saving sacrifice of Jesus Christ our Lord. It is not earned by any merits of our own. However, we are still obligated to refrain from sin, because sin is the problem. Sin is what separates us from God. If I'm sinning and being selfish, I'm not loving God. Get ourself in the way, yeah. I'm not loving Jesus. <clears throat> Thank you, Chuck. Okay. Well, here's the... Uh, it, yes. It is not earned by merits of our own. So we've got something to work on. And you know what? It's good that we have something to work on. If we arrived, okay, I'm perfect now. We'd go back to our old ways and we wouldn't be perfect anymore. We gloat over it. We would probably gloat over it. Hey, I'm better than you because I'm perfect and you're not. Yeah. <laughs> if, if, if being a Christian was just a little pill, now salvation is a little pill. I've accepted Jesus. I've repented of my sins. I've confessed Him as my Lord. I've been immersed in His name. I am saved. Period. Does that mean you can't lose your salvation? Yeah. If I say, you know what, Jesus, I don't want you anymore. He doesn't force himself on you for the rest of your life. You can backslide. That's a whole other subject. We'll have to cover that another time. But, as long as I love Jesus and I'm trying. Now, years ago, I parked my son's car on the street and put a for sale sign on it. 
didn't realize that you could only leave it there so long or you're going to get a little yellow envelope with a little piece of paper inside that wants some of your green in order to make them happy. So I had to pay a penalty. I learned to move the car. I tried to appeal the case. I said, I didn't know. <laughs> with man's law, ignorance is not an excuse. The great thing about God is He is a mind reader and a heart reader, yes. and He understands if you have not been taught, right. or have not read, or have not learned that this is wrong. And God can, by His power and Lord, mercy Lord. and grace, can overlook that. <clears throat> he may teach you so that next time you'll know better, but He can overlook that. He knows our hearts. He knows mm. we're trying Lord. to be perfect in His eyes. What a covenant. Huh? What a covenant. Whew. Not by my merit, yeah. but by His grace. Yeah. Not that I can deserve or own or pay for, but because He loves me. And He knows I'm trying to love Him as best I know how. <clears throat> well, our conclusion is this. God knows the best way for us to live, and we should be challenged to find and follow His will in our lives. And I like to spend that message. Oh, glory. If okay. we do things <clears throat> God's way, we give God's blessings. If we do it our way, we keep running into trouble. Jim, you got this that? This best stuff is, is God's Jesus in our heart, like we've all been sharing here, and that blood of Jesus, that's His best for us. Woo, I mean, blood I picked Jesus. it up off a Christian program the other day. I didn't, didn't drop in quite like it did then. But. I'm going to get a muzzle for you. you know? <laughs> <laughs> just, just give me a refill here. <laughs> hey, we're just getting excited here. Give me a refill. Now, I'm Jesus is going to tell us, <laughs> Jesus is telling us how we can be perfect in the eyes of God. And this is part of the reason why we're getting to know Jesus. So we can work on being more perfect in the eyes of God. Next week, next week, Jesus is going to talk to us about giving, fasting, and praying. How do these things apply to your relationship with God? That fasting thing go over to the last time we did it. Remember? Well, we'll talk about it more Remember next that? week. Now it's time to turn over to page 150. You can follow us and stay in touch with what is happening with the Getting to Know Jesus Bible Study Ministry on Plaxo, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and watch our video clips on YouTube and GodTube. Getting to Know Jesus is sponsored by New Hope Gospel Ministries. If you'd like to follow along with us and start your Getting to Know Jesus Bible Study group, or just pray for us or support our ministry, you can go to www.gettingtoknowjesus.org and find all the information that we have available for you. If you look at the lower right-hand corner, there's a button where you can make a safe and secure donation to the Getting to Know Jesus Bible Study Ministry. Or you can go to the order page and order your Getting to Know Jesus books for your Bible study group. Thank you for stopping by and keep us in your prayers and let us know how we can pray for you.